game number one best of five ladies and gentlemen and it's going to be great we have nothing left against granite gaming it's pretty much the number one against the number two in the standings right now the internal battle that we had this season so far with the two of them fighting who has the pole position washed up is actually starting to also chip in here a little bit after initially they struggled in uh, the standings but yeah those two teams they have played so well and mopsio is now a fixed part of nothing left so zadun is not playing with them anymore at least not at the time so mopsio is currently just at that front line always a staple for nothing left which obviously makes these boys even stronger but this is going to be a great one this should be an awesome series no matter how many games we're going to see here i expect them to be high quality we have on the side of granite now the quick ban against mayev zaratul gets banned out too and on Volskaya Foundry, I mean, there's still, you could, it's always a question of how exactly you want to play it here. You can still ban Anubarak, Ana is still out there, could warrant the ban, for example. There's also Rexa, which gets picked a lot still by nothing left. And also on the side of um, Team Russia, for example. But there's the Anubarak ban. So uh, no quick try attempts at burst or anything like that. And there is Ana. Alright. Ana banned out as more or less expected. That combo with a nano boost onto a Liming, onto a Jaina, it's just crazy. And obviously there's a lot of other heroes that would benefit from it as well. But there's a Tyrande early pick. It is Granite Gaming and the old rule still holds true. If Granite can get Tyrande early on, they usually will do that. In 90% of the drafts, they will just first pick Tyrande in the first rotation if they have a chance to pull that off. Teams have started to ban it against them a little bit. And as I said in the past, it's not necessarily just about one player being good on a hero. It's at the same time about an entire team playing well around what the hero, hero offers. And Granite Gaming with Toranda, generally speaking, is just really good at getting these coordinated kills. So a lot of teams have started to ban it um, out against them. But it's always a question, do you really feel that this is the linchpin that you have to target or not? For now, Mopsio uh, on... Uh, Diablo, we're seeing uh, also Hanzo being picked here, and immediately ETC and Leoric. So with ETC in particular, this is one of uh, one of Lauba's favorites, obviously, and he is pretty solid on that hero too. I mean, we have seen him with a lot of stage dive in ETC as the main tank position, going onto the off lane. We've seen mosh pits from him, so it's very flexible in the way that he plays there. And it's honestly the character, the hero that he made his name with. Like when he was still just an absolute amateur player, his ETC was always his standout hero and was oftentimes targeted against him in drafts. By now the entire hero pool for him has definitely broadened, so it's a lot harder to target him in the draft. But definitely still happening sometimes. Liming gets banned out as well, so no Liming for Tai. At this point, it's only a bit of a question what's going to happen around Tracer, because that's an option for sure. But Tai has played a lot more. I mean, we've seen him on the melee as well, we've seen him on the Thrall, we've seen him on Zeratul, who's obviously banned. So there's definitely options for him. Hammer gets banned out, good choice here too. This is the map where Rich back then in HTC 2018 brought Hammer back into the meta. He was the one who started it all on Volskaya Foundry. And then it was just hammer, hammer, hammer. And there's the Rexa. Talked about it earlier. We have that Rexa pick. Linked on Malfurion. And what's Ty gonna play? Swam Grotta. Oftentimes we're seeing that Junkrat on his part. Could see a Jaina. Jaina and Junkrat, I would at least expect one of the two to be picked by them now. And... Ty's hero is gonna be interesting. If there is a super aggressive one, it's usually his pick that we're seeing there. And it is. Ah, Jaina and Vala. They love to play their Vala and they still do that again. Ty has played, I mean, three or four times Vala already this season, which is kind of interesting because Vala wasn't really a hero that had that much of an impact before, but now that's also a composition where she can excel. I mean, ETC together with Vala was always a really good combo because you have space that you can easily create with ETC to make sure that Vala is a bit safer. That face melt is a fantastic tool if you're trying to keep I, her yeah. in play. And Nezebo for nothing left! Okay! Nezebo is in the game! Well, Sky Foundry, ladies and gentlemen, the best of five here in Division S. And we have the Witch Doctor on the last pick for nothing left. So let's find out if that's actually a success for them or if we're gonna see the lead for Granite Gaming here in game number one. Game number one, Volskaya Foundry. Polyboss for nothing left on the left. On Rexa, linked on Malfurion, Mopsy on Diablo. We have Blake Kidney on Bri. 
And DAB on Hanzo. Towards the right side of the map, Granite Gaming in the series today with Henning on Tyrande, <laughs> I mean, as usual. Fury on Leoric, Tai on Vala, Lauba on ETC, and Slam Grotta on Jaina. All right, time to shine. Excited for this one. I mean, first of all, we're seeing the Vala composition with ETC. That by itself is already pretty awesome. But at the same time, the big question is still, what can that Nazebo do in the late game? And traditionally speaking, when Warskaya was introduced, it was a map that usually went straight into the late game and a lot of the lesser teams, especially in HCC, were experimenting very, very much so with Nazebo. <laughs> Already dancing here. The Kidnate day on his main account, actually. Not on that smurf that he normally uses in Division S. But so, that was always a pretty interesting part. And now we obviously have seen those changes to the protector and everything, and they just seem to bank on the ability of keeping Nazebo in a late game scenario where the Vile Infection can absolutely reign supreme. And his damage is honestly annoying. I mean, again, he has a lot of damage that he can put to the table, damage over time in particular. So we'll actually find out how exactly that's going to work out for them. I'm curious because I did expect a couple of wild picks to come out in this series. I didn't quite expect it to happen in game one. And yeah, the pick, I haven't seen Nazebo in any kind of higher level competitive play in Asia, so pretty hyped for this one. Also, Vala, with the setup from Tai and especially now with level one Hot Pursuit, I would still expect the multi shot variation being picked by Tai here. And then also Manticore later on in the game against Diablo in particular. Don't really think that we're gonna see anything out of the ordinary here. No creed of the hunter. I don't think that Ty is gonna fall for the noob trap here. Granted, if you pick creed here, and again, I don't think it's happening, you have actually the chance of stacking it a bit easier because not only is there Diablo to consider, but usually Misha is in range so that you can stack against that. So, especially in this setup, if you're playing on an amateur league, that's always where the talent becomes a little bit more appealing. And I guess it's an option, but especially without a Tassada in the mix, where you could even capitalize on the extra auto attack damage with a shield, I don't think it's happening. And yeah, that's not the case. So we're seeing traditional build, punishment already coming in, and the fight for the beacon after the turrets already got taken. So they're actually trading here, as you can see. They drop their own turret, and they get the beacon in exchange, and as nothing left sees the turret being dropped, they're just saying, well, you know what, you just trade an item, we are not gonna drop our own turret and force a fight that we might lose, and then you're even farther ahead, just take it, whatever, we don't care. And we have at least even items, in, in the sense that every team has one, but obviously there's a slight advantage to the healing beacon still. Podiboss again with the animal husbandry on the other hand. So these days it's a lot more common to see the hunter-gatherer taken for the quest completion armor. But now we're having again the attempt to simply increase that hit point pool of Rexa and Misha. And as long as you don't die and play it safe, there is a huge chance of you just having a massive amount of hit points in the later stages. Now that whole thing kicks in roughly two minutes in, so we can definitely calculate that through later on, how much you can benefit from that talent. But obviously, time is quite important in this case. Time is of the essence. But we have the objective now up again, and that is where Nothing Left is even starting to take a slight lead here. Spider setup here for Nazebo, by the way. Going on level four straight into the big voodoo. So trying to capitalize on that hit point pull too. This means there's a lot of a lot of fuels to go through in the later stage of the game that have insane hit point pools. So if you expect a long game, that's definitely the setup to go for here. Lauba trying to create some space for his team. They have been doing fantastic this league, and there's the level seven. That's obviously an advantage that they try to capitalize on with a quick push against Mopsio. That early level seven is definitely helping, but nothing left gets theirs too. But in this case, it's a perfect example of how the small window. These few seconds with the level 7 talent have actually had a huge impact because it forced nothing left off the control point. And now we're having another item taken too, so we already have the turret. On the left side we see a similar picture. Lauba is already checking that out and is just saying hello here, which triggered a rotation for Misha nearly. Uh, Mopsio? Mopsio is a little bit alone here and eats a lot of damage with this. Now he doesn't fall, but that's a lot of damage. Uh, it was not really necessary if we are... If we're, if we're being honest here. So yeah, I need to be, be a bit careful. I mean, don't get me wrong, Link is trying his best to heal him up again, but Mopsy being on half HP is definitely a bit of an issue. 
That was too much free damage that he ate, and it looks like they're gonna give this one up. Nazebo is already top side. Raxa has moved down to the bottom, and yep, Protector is taken by Granite Gaming. So they already have that, and are straight moving into the mid lane. Again, traditional rotation. You busy the mid lane a little bit, and then you rotate towards the top to take the fountain down. You prep for objective number two, and make sure that you have a slight advantage there. And obviously, the Protector has been changed by quite a bit. Ty is using the cover take this one down easily, but as you can see, Protector is already extremely low. They're trying to go for the kill against Mopsio. The wall has fallen, and it's actually Vala in this case, who's going straight for, uh, for, the, for the setup here against the fountain. And that thing is going to fall one way or another. Protector comes in, <laughs> takes it down. Uh, it's an easy peasy one. They're waiting for the heroes to come out. Mopsio is still a little bit too low to really have an impact there. Also, Linked has not dropped that second turret yet either, so they have still two turrets. They just said at some point, yeah, we're gonna give this one up. The early level 10 is gonna be the reward for Granite Gaming for now, but then also the later position, as both of the teams are looking at heroic abilities right now. We have seen a lot of strafe actually from time. Not sure if we're gonna see the Reign of Vengeance this time. I mean, there is already a Mosh Pit, there is on top of that Orson and Tomb, so you can definitely capitalize with the Reign of Vengeance, but he played a lot of strafe recently on his Valas. Yeah. Mosh pit in. The... Yeah, we see Gary. Gary the Gigantian is coming back into play. For a long time, Gary wasn't picked. It was the Ravenous Spirit. It was mainly because Gary was just too stupid. That thing would attack a minion if next to it there was a big battle with a 5 versus 5 and heroes everywhere, nearly dying. But Gary would always go for the minions. <laughs> Lauba now down. Great setup, actually. Very well played. Yeah, but Gary went to school, Gary got smart, and now Rexa is down. That's the end of the Animal Husbandry. So six minutes in, nearly seven minutes in is where the entire thing gets reset. Definitely not a great move here. Yeah, Gary got smart, he went to university. And now he is a pretty regular pick on the Zebos. That was a good kill against Rexa. that was actually worth it. That's four minutes of stacks already gone, and well, calculate that through. Every second you get two additional max health. So that's 120 per minute. On three minutes in, he roughly picked it. So that's four minutes of that down. That's roughly 400, make it 500 HP, more max HP that he currently lost and that he has to recover. So that's actually a really good one. That's a great one at this point for them. It was a good kill. Oh, and they're going for the Zebo Oblic Kidney. Yeah, sorry, bro, but you're not going to get out of this one. The wall wasn't bad, don't get me wrong. But the water elemental, for example, wasn't even needed in this case. The slow would, of course, have finally pushed him down here. But yeah, they can even push that in with the next minion wave that now comes through and try and take down the fort itself. There comes the slide, and there's the mosh pit against Diablo. And that's gonna be him falling. Dibbles down, there's another entomb. Granite Gaming, murdering it. Malfurion is dead, and they go for Misha. Misha is down, Malfurion is down, Diablo lost his souls, they go for the fort, and Granite Gaming is absolutely dominating these fights. Four kills against one, they're even going now for the camp to steal that away. Fantastic setup here by them. They're trying to go for another kill too. They're just threatening Opsu the entire time. Ty gets attacked but immediately moves out, no problem for him. And they steal the camp, easy peasy. Everybody up here to the top, but now with the control point announced, they can move in for that too. Oh, nicely done. With the 13 talents, we're now also seeing Gloom again against the Zebo. That might become quite important here towards the later stage of the game. I want to highlight again the build that we're actually seeing from uh, ETC. Again, full focus into the face melt. Going straight here for the pinball wizard, but the important ones are the loudspeaker and the level 13 talent. It's about creating space for Vala. If Vala gets attacked, he's going to hold that back and then can use that quite easily. Uh, Dibbles. Oh, they can't get the kill against... They get the kill against ETC, but they lose Diablo too. Uh, already the heals on the ground here. But still a trade in kills at least. Keep in mind, the 20 is of course what Nazebo is going to look at. And they get the kill against Hanzo. They actually drop him and they drop the bear as well. Once more the damage output, Ty just killing it. Quite literally with this Vala. 27,000 damage by him now. But there is the Nazebo factor. If you have level 20 and you get the Violent Infection, if you have your baseline stacks together, his damage output is getting insane. 
And honestly, so far, we're actually seeing decent stacks on his end. 127 on level 13. Yeah, that's pretty much a guarantee that on 20, he will have it ready. So... Uh, that's what we're going to look at here in terms of the damage output. Another thing we should probably highlight is that Jaina is currently on 11,000 damage for the baseline. So once that she has the ice block, that's going to be another important tool in her belt. We're having by now also 15 against 14, entire level lead. I keep also Raxa in mind a little bit. He kind of was killed around the 7 minute mark, so that's 3 minutes in. So he has a nice hit point boost since then, roughly 360 hit points additionally. But yeah, that one death of Rexa definitely hurt him quite a bit. If you're going for that talent, you want to get a bit more out of it. And you really don't want to die that early. It was just one of these mid-game kills that is a bit of an issue. You know, the pressure at the top, and they actually have to Hearthstone back here. Most of them, at least. Podiboss is still sitting. So yeah, We're having the rotation with the Protector. I mean, obviously, this one wasn't even contested. The 16 was too close. They knew they couldn't do anything here. They just have to try to... Defend as much as they can, burn it down if possible, get their own level 16. Granite Gaming is currently in full control, and as already prophesied earlier, Manticore, the talent on level 16 now, together with the Numbing Blast for the additional route. But yeah, Tai is going to threaten Diablo even more now, and of course, that's also going to apply to Rexai and Misha, especially as the hit point pool of the two gets increased with the hus Animal Husbandry. Yeah, they get the entombment. The slow is there too. Immediately the arrow from Hanzo. The attempt by Link to keep everybody alive. But Tai just has too much damage on this end now. The Manticore is doing so much work. And Diablo is down. So is Misha. That fort is obviously falling as well. And yeah, the damage output, as you can see, 30,000 right now for Vala. Another five levels until they're seeing the Zebo with the Vala infection. But the push is already moving straight onto the bot lane wall i mean this is important again you're preparing the bottom of the map for objective number three and if you can take the fort down and it's the last one obviously you're trying to push for the keep but this matters a lot because if granite wins the third objective too they don't even have to deal with those turrets anymore with those towers there they can immediately go through the gate itself nice ice floor good job Blake hit me yeah, gets rooted from Jaina. Jaina now with her own quest completion. Mosh Pit is there. Gets the ice block through for a second. Yeah, but there's no kills just yet. Once again, the poke comes in. Yeah, not only that, Fury with the Entomb again against Mopsio. Mopsio on 50 stacks. That's not a lot. And here comes the kill against the Zebo. He's down. And we might even see Mopsio fall. The maze to the face as Fury goes in with another swing. Great kill here against Dibbles. And that's 10 kills against two now. And it opens up the bot lane even more. As we're seeing the teams starting to move in for this, taking down another keep. It's a disaster for nothing left right now. They have the 16, but they are in the 3 versus 5 situation. And that is just an untenable situation for them right now. 18, the level lead. Oof, it's, it's rough. It's honestly rough. At this point, they're just going for the items again and trying to take the item advantage as quickly as you can with this setup. Starting to move in straight there with the first turret. They can claim the healing beacon now before Diablo is back on the map and can then go for their own turret too. The rotation is not going to be there in time. The Zebo and Diablo are just not going to make it in time and the rest of the team shouldn't move in just yet. This is a quick burn. That's an easy one. Has no problem. Henning is getting that and that's even more experience. I mean, it's not only about the items. It's really the experience too that comes into play with this. And that's another big issue because level 20 is so close. If you look at the experience setup, the mercenary experience that we're seeing right now is a massive advantage. I mean, that's nearly three times what we are seeing. Make it two and a half. So it's crazy. Massive lead, honestly. And the passive experience, that's of course getting gapped more and more. With three forts taken out and a keep, whereas we're not seeing a single structure destroyed by nothing left yet, it's just way too much for them to handle. Now, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about Rexa again, just to give you guys a bit of an idea, it's currently sitting at 4,300 hit points. We can compare that to Diablo real quickly. So Diablo at this point, um, as you can see down here, the extra hit point pool uh, that we are having, 860. 862, so he has, has a few hit points, not quite at a thousand yet, Rexa that is. But if you compare it to Diablo, Diablo is sitting at 6,400, so still 2,000 ahead. Level 20 talents are there. There's the flank. Yeah, threatening the mosh pit, already getting the water elemental in for the slow. And they're chasing DAB. Chasing DAB, Diablo here gets mosh pitted, and the arrow, yeah, the arrow comes in, but let's face it, that's not going to change anything. 
Dibbles is still down, Diablo is down, and yeah, it is a problem, uh, for sure. Uh, Rexa is by now sitting at an additional 900 hit points. Once again, they're starting to move in through the bot lane. Strafe again. Far Flight, Quiver, Jaina, the only one who's sitting on the point. And once that they... I, I mean, honestly, with the keep already gone, once that they get the Protector, is there any chance for nothing left to defend this? I don't really think so. Maybe with level 20... Maybe with a vile infection, but how realistic is it for the blue team to soak two entire levels now? I would say it is pretty impossible. I mean the lanes are getting pushed out already again We're having a damage output 42,000 for Vala, 40,000 for Jaina. Rexa at this point has an additional 1,000 hit points thanks to uh, his animal husbandry, but that's not gonna help them either. He's still far behind Diablo and yeah, uh, it's, it's just tough. This is a protector that they also have to give up, so things are not looking too good. The only one who has died twice is Lauba at the front on his ETC. I mean, again, he's the one that has to protect the backline, and so far he has done a great job with that. But here comes the attempted GG push from Granite Gaming as they're moving down to the bottom of the map in a Hail Mary attempt of nothing left to somehow defend against it. Buried alive already being used. They're going for Jaina. Svam Grotta has still the ice block ready, and that's the end of Diablo. He's down again, and Misha is also falling. Podibos dies. Resets his stacks, obviously, too. Not that it matters at this point. Blake Kidney is trying his best to somehow play around it, but they're just going for the core. It looks like Granite Gaming is going to take the lead in this series right here. The shield is falling within seconds, and then five versus three. There's just no way. They even leave the protector, drop all of the items, chase them a little bit longer. Blake Kidney is just sitting there dancing around. He knows that the game is done with. And that is another kill. Another one against Malfurion as the core falls. And Granite Gaming takes the lead in the best of three series here against nothing left at Division S. GG. Well played. Game number one was a pretty good one for Granite Gaming at least that is. Wasn't quite that great for nothing left. Now we're on Towers of Doom, our second game of the series in Division S. And Granite Gaming has that lead. And obviously the big question is still, can they take another one? When it comes to Towers of Doom, there is still tie to be considered with his Tracer. And obviously Globals are usually playing a role here too. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Haka on one side and Leoric on the other. But let's have a quick look of what's happening around the first picks here. Now, first of all, this is the map choice of Granite Gaming. With nothing left losing, they had the choice to go either into map choice or into um, into first pick, first ban. They decided in favor of first pick, first ban, banning out Anna here right away. And uh, We kind of know what Granite Gaming wants. If they get Tyrande again, they're going to get Tyrande. It's more so a question of nothing left ability or willingness to ban the hero out or maybe instead saying like you know what we're gonna pick her first this time just so you can get her interrupt against the altar channels are obviously annoying too my f gets banned it's always one of these things if you don't ban my f against nothing left bleak kidney locks that in right away and that's usually the moment when you're like mistakes were made and yeah then in the next game my f gets banned again <laughs> that's usually what happens bleak kidney destroying people with that hero then on the setup but yeah, so let's have a bit of an idea what nothing left bans. And again, Zaratul is still up. They can ban a new Burak though. So at this point it's up to Granite Gaming if they want to get rid of Zaratul or not. But I still want to highlight that we're having heroes like Tracer still in play and they're still possible here. So that is going to be the interesting part. Zaratul banned, yes or no? Tracer getting picked? May I mean, we're talking Thai Tracer, but DAB is on the other side, right? So you really have to think about that. Both of the teams have good Tracer players and can really play quite nicely around that. Uh, so, let's see. Tracer, no Tracer. Dibbles! Dibbles on the first pick. Okay. So the insta pick into Diablo. I'm actually a little bit surprised that they go for Diablo that early in the draft. I mean, again, on this map you have quite a lot of options of what to go for from a tank perspective. I would be shocked to not see Tyrande, I'm gonna be honest. It's like the pick for Granite Gaming. Henning is probably annoying them already in drafts. It's like, pick it! 
Actually, he's actually a host, so yeah, he will I pick it himself. Shocking! Shocking. Who would have thought? Taranda and Jaina instantly picked. Yeah, I mean, first of all, again, it's, it's burst heaven. You can play that with ETC, you can play it with Garrosh. So many options on this. So, what are we gonna have from Nothing Left? Is it gonna be a setup with Tracer for any one of these teams? Are we gonna see a Tracer? Yes, we do. I guess more Furion together with that? Yeah. Malf, Tracer, great setup, and if you can get it, why wouldn't you? But I can guarantee you that Granite Gaming was already well aware that this is definitely one of the most likely options from Nothing Left. You have to be on the other side, so at some point you have to face the music and say either we pick her or she's getting picked from the opponent's team. So now the question is simply how do you deal with that? It was actually insane. The other day we had Washed Up play against Nothing Left and they countered it by simply going for... Um, washed up uh, went against it with a variant that was an interesting one haven't seen that in a while there's the ban against Tehaka and I kind of want to bet that in the next rotation of picks for Granite Gaming we're going to see Leoric being picked again I would be a little bit surprised and not see Leo unless nothing left of course just bans it straight up out now Leo is great because he can soak both of the lanes pretty easily he has a big impact during the fights then too but it's really that wave clear rotation maybe Malthael yeah, but they ban Leo out Leo gets banned. So at this point, the question is, are you going to go for Malthael? Can threaten Diablo a little bit more with the last rides later on. Has also the time to rotate between the lanes, so I could definitely see Malthael on their end. Thrall is out too. I mean, he's strong, so Thrall could be an option. Depends a little bit on what kind of main tank they're going for at the end of the day. But with that setup here, you could go into Garrosh, yes, for the taunt against Tracer, understand. Ooh, Greymane for Ty, alright, Cursed Bullet. Late game pick into... I was just about to say that Granite Gaming could still go for Malthael, but looking at it, nothing left has actually a lot of interest heading into that hero too. Against Garrosh, that isn't too bad. The question is always, can you keep him alive, yes or no? Uh, let's see what uh, what Blake Kidney is going to pick. John Gratasada, double support for them. All right, double support with the Tracer, and John Grat with the mix now too. Uh, and what's going to be the last pick? What's Fury going to get for the off lane? Are we going to see that Malthael in that setup? Are they going to go for a Thrall, trying to get those chain lightnings in against Tracer again? Yeah, uh, hesitating. But it ends up being ETC. ETC on the off lane. So a bit of a stage dive setup. Still a global. Okay. Garrosh ETC. A lot of stuns. A lot of setups for Toranda, for Jaina, and for Greyman. There's a lot of control that they have for that. Not a bad variation. Granite Gaming. Game number two, ladies and gentlemen. Towers of Doom as they are heading off against nothing left in the second game. Game number two. We are on Towers of Boom. Nothing left. On the left side, Granite Gaming on the right, and the blue team with Blakitney on Junkrat, DAB on Tracer. We're seeing Mopsy on Diablo, Linked on Malfurion, and Potibos on Tassada. On the right side of the map, Granite Gaming with Henning on Taranda, Ty currently on Greymane. That's going to be an interesting one. Lauba is playing Garrosh. We're currently seeing a Fury on ETC again at side lane ETC with a potential mosh pit. Ah, uh, sorry, the potential stage dive. I would actually be shocked if it's not stage dive. As a side lane ETC, it's pretty much a must. And Swam Grotta on Jaina. Ah, it's time to shine. Should be a good one. I'm actually liking this one a lot because Greyman is kind of fun to cast, generally speaking. And obviously there's a couple of different ideas that we're having on the side of Granite Gaming. If you're playing Garrosh plus ETC, you have a lot of control, a lot of stuns. And yeah, Diablo already experiencing exactly that power slide and a dead Mopsio. That's exactly what I meant. You have the slows of Jaina, you have the stun of Turanda, the Hunter's Mark, the stun of Fury, the, putting the en enemy back in with a face melt, and Lauba already with stuns and slows and later on also with a taunt. The control that you're seeing from those heroes is insane, and the burst damage obviously comes with it. So it's a setup where if you get on anybody with the entire team, you can ping pong them around for half a day and they will never be able to escape. So it's one of the cool setups that you can pull off of that combo, and it nets them an early game kill immediately. So it's one of the biggest things here at this point. Yeah, I'm honestly curious to see how the blue team is going to try to deal with that. 
Yeah, the voice crack in there for a moment. Something stuck in the throat. Should need nuts before cast. Doesn't really work too well. Blink it near this point. Actually in a bit of trouble. Ooh, uh, I'm saying that and then Diablo comes in and gets the wall stun against Tyrande. That was a good one. Swam Grotta low, but as long as he doesn't fall, Lauba is on the run. Uh, Swam Grotta is going to die here eventually too. He's just buying time at this point. He's just saying like, la 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 la. I mean, you can at least get a little bit of damage in against those minions. Oh, there we go. Let's get himself killed. Obviously, Mopsy was willing to let this one slide too. Ty has fallen on the right side, so the two of them pretty much dying at the same time here. And that's two kills. Three kills against one right now. Very good setup. So the early game might not have started off well, but then that invade that we see from Granite Gaming... I mean, the, inv well, the invade itself worked. They got the camp. The <laughs> problem is they lost three heroes in the process. So it didn't go quite as well as they were hoping here. Um, but again... At this point, we are having still a slight advantage in experience for nothing left, just simply because they were able to get these kills. Indomitable, of course, on level 4 now on the side of Garrosh. Level 4 talents on the other side with, again, the extra life leech for Tracer. I mean, for Tacita, but Tracer as the main recipient of the shield. A little bit of an explosion against Fury topside, but yeah, <laughs> DAB immediately with a blink out. If he gets caught by that stun, then Swamp Grotta's damage might not kill him, but definitely put him into a really bad position from a hit point perspective. Four men at the top. So there's a double, it's a triple altar actually. Down two at the top, one at the bottom. Only gray men at the bot lane right now. And are they gonna invade? Are they gonna try to make the play for the two at the top? It seems like it. And down at the bottom of the map, gray men is currently occupying two heroes. And there's the channel. They come in with the rest of the team. Okay. Grey main moving up top two. Uh, now it's a four versus three. It looks like Granite Gaming is actually considering to let two slide. Yeah, they're not going to make the play for this one. It's always difficult to go for the one at the left side. Your opponent, if they lose a hero, will be back on the map in just no time and they'll have the fountain close too. Which is problematic. But tie at the bottom of the map. This is really what I want to see later on. Once we have level 10, what can Tai really do in the team fights? Because I think. A lot of the kill potential hinges on him. It's a I mean, it's not quite true because I explained earlier on already how important these stuns are going to be. And if you really time the stuns well and you set them up well, then Swam Grotta should be able to get a ton of damage out. But for me personally, Ty is a little bit the finisher with potential go for the throat then later on where he can just always jump from one hero to another and take them down. And that's kind of what they have to watch out for. So I feel when the 5 versus 5 matches start and they are able to just get some damage on these heroes, they should be able to put Greyman into a position where he can start finishing off heroes. But I gotta admit that Nothing Left is currently doing pretty well with this. Obviously you have DAB on the other side and his Tracer is legendary. I mean, he is so good on that hero that after teams realized in HGC how good he is, he got target banned over and over and over again. And yeah, ever since then, DAB in most tournaments and most events didn't even get access to Tracer. There's a delay, by the way, still. That one hasn't been claimed yet, so what they're currently doing is delay the game. Going to the late game with that. So it's actually an interesting tactic here. If you want to go for a late game setup, then you can oftentimes just let this one slide. ETC is now rotating in because they're seeing the commitment at the bottom. So ETC gets the channel at the top. So the next altar phase is going to start tickle down, but they give up the camp for that. And there's the channel. The four shots fired very late. 32 against 36 right now. But again, I want to highlight that that was actually at, like, intentionally. It was an intentional choice by Nothing Left to let that one slide. To just let it at the top left and just say, you know what, we don't take that right now. We're going to delay the game. We're going to go into a late game scenario against them. Here in the early game, with everything that they have, they are too dangerous. And if we delay the objective a little bit and aren't really forced into a fight too soon, then we have a better setup later on once the level 10 abilities are ready for us. Again, camp there, still on the way. Okay. And you can tell they're not really going to fight. It's all a question of how strong your early game foreman is. And with all that ping pong and all that CC that we're seeing, for Granite Gaming, that is a bit of a concern. And so they are playing also for level 10 abilities right now. But the bot lane is heavily pressured by Granite Gaming. And they are starting to get a solid lead with this. <laughs> nice, I like that. Jungrat immediately pushing out the pumpkin and that one gets taken down. All right, Mopsio gets attacked. Yeah, there's the throw, there's the stun, there's the second stun, the follow up and Mopsio is down. This is exactly the problem, exactly that. Just way too much CC, the damage output. And as you could see, 
Tai didn't even have to go for the engage. He could just always stay in range the entire time because he was like, well, we're going to kill him anyways. We don't have to commit to anything here. That's exactly the set that you want to go for. There's a slide again. Ooh, Fury and Henning not coordinating properly. Yeah, Fury pushed Tracer back and therefore she didn't get hit by the stun from Taranda and could blink out. I don't think they would have gotten the kill, but still, that's obviously something that you're going to try and fix. Massive commitment in the bot lane right now. Tai, whenever he can get into the Worgen form onto the structure, he will obviously be able to do a ton of damage here. Uh, nice attempt. Good job by Blikitne, but not quite able to push him back in. Nice attempt, though. There's the level 10s now on both sides, and there we go. Already with the old Indomitable being used by Garrosh, but Lauba is too far out and gets taken down. Still the channel through ETC, and that's another kill. Henning is dead as well, that's a double kill, but the objective ends up in the hands of Granite Gaming. But it comes at a cost, two heroes go down. Stage dive was never used because they just said ETC, go channel, channel the middle, we don't care. And he is still soaking the lanes. And actually at this point, that's a lot of experience lost at the top lane, as you can see here. Because nobody from the blue team is there to soak it. And they're going to lose even more. But they have now the opportunity to push through the bot lane a bit more aggressively. Which is exactly what they're doing. So a bit of damage onto that bell tower as well. ETC is moving topside. And it's just trying to see if we can maybe interrupt the rotation. But that is starting to close the gap in experience slowly again. Because there's experience that the blue team misses out on. Again, the bullet comes out. Not even for the go for the throat. And there's the stage dive. And that's again the Diablo down. Well played. These are the setups that Granite Gaming is hoping for. Get mass CC onto a target. Drop the Hunter's Mark. And then unleash the entire damage. And as you could see, we actually don't have Ty going for go for the throat. Against heroes like DAB's Tracer or Blake Kidney's Junkrat. Or even Link's Malfury. And no, instead, Cursed Bullet. It's all about just dominating Mopsio. Just destroy Mopsio. Just look at Mopsio the entire time. He is just... They are, they're shitting on him. It's really difficult for Mopsio to play Diablo right now. Because if he gets too close, he gets bullied around, he gets stun locks, there is a blizzard, there are cursed bullets flying against him the entire time, and that low cooldown is getting exploited. Here again, he always has to push out immediately or he's in trouble. And then it's a question if nothing left can capitalize on the defense, and currently they're trying to do that, but they burn a lot of cooldowns already. Mops is again at the front, Cursed Bullet is ready again for Grey Mane, and they're already zoning him out here. With that amount of CC, nothing left, have to be so careful with the engage. It's not impossible, we've seen a lot of kills, they are leading in kills actually. But as you can imagine, it's definitely one of these situations when you move out a little bit too much, you're down. Another Cursed Bullet, and it actually connects, this time only against a low HP hero, but it doesn't really matter. The cooldown is so low that you can just throw it out the entire time. And Ty is doing exactly that. There's again the taunt. There's the blizzard. The commitment and the kill. Diablo dead again. Without souls, he just can't survive through that. And now they're even chasing Tassada here. Water Elemental with a slow is coming in as well. They're trying to make the play here. But this time the bomb actually doesn't connect. In comes Link. Gets thrown through and is also obliterated. Four shots against fired against the core of the blue team. And now nothing left is down. 2.24 at this point. Ah, nicely done. Nicely done by them. Lauba is already sitting in place. They're going straight for the bell tower at the bottom of the map and they're taking it. 13 is on the board for them. And again, they can control the map also with a global. Tie again with the ult immediately. Curse bullet, boom, the entire time. Straight to the face, one time after another. The damage output on his side, 25,000. Not quite on the same level as Tracer, but still pretty decent. The bell tower obviously already converted and that in itself is amazing right now. Getting the bot lane control and the pumpkins. Doing well with that. 13 on both sides. Again Diablo and that should be a kill. Taunt comes out a bit late. Well timed. And that is now death number 5 on Dibbles. And again the problem for Diablo is also he is low on souls. The lower he is on those souls the easier it is to set the kill combo up. It's an insane setup. It's honestly crazy. Especially with ETC being part of it too. It's all about the CC. Look at DAB. DAB is already incredibly low. If anybody would have rotated up now, they could have maybe even gotten the kill against him. It's not quite what happened there, but still. It's honestly... It's, it, I mean, they are dominating right now. Granted Gaming, that is. And what Nothing Left needs is they need a good engage and they need pretty much a solo action from DAB to get a kill. Pressure someone. Maybe a good wall stun from Diablo would also do the trick here and really set it up so that 
DAB can get the kill here. Fury is obviously soaking topside, but he's always ready to jump out. Ty is the one who's gonna try and channel the bot lane, whereas the rest delays in the middle. And then ETC, after he takes another lane, is going to move in for it. Already, here's the channel. This one against Tassada. They're trying to make the play for Swamgrotta. J9 in trouble. Here's the bullet. Dibbles in trouble. And dead again. Diablo died the sixth time now. DAB tries to move out. He gets ripped too. And all of a sudden, with two kills here, the rest of the team is already on the run. They're trying to get even a little bit more as Link and Podiboss are the next focus of the setup. Power slide. There it is. And they're going for Tassada. But he still has the dimensional shift. Gets away. But five shots fired now. And that's single digits on the core. 10 shots against them in this little encounter and now they can go for the boss too because two heroes are still dead. They are absolutely demolishing them right now. It's a fantastic coordinated play from Granite Gaming that we're observing here. And they want the pole position again. This is the fight for the number one spot and right now nothing left just... Oh! <laughs> again the setup! Nice! Fury with a good play. Four shots fired that puts them down to four on the core. And we are still... It's an experience range at least for them. But as you can tell, this is rough. This is very rough now for nothing left. The entire idea here is to really put the AB into a position where he can dominate the opponent's team with all of that output. They even didn't go for a second melee hero. There comes Tassada, the good attack. Laub on the other hand. Did he get, did he get pushed in? Not quite. And the bullet is out again. Boom. Mops your... I mean, again, think about how often Mopsio died in the last two, three minutes and how few stacks he got together for his souls. He went from 30 to 46. 16 additional souls is all that he got. Not more. He has an insanely tough time to get tanky again. And yeah, it's all the coordination that we see from Granite Gaming. And they're just saying, guys, you want, you want number one? You're not going to get it. We're going to destroy you. We are the top dogs in Division S right now. We're going to prove it right here. They go for Mopsio again, and if they can't get the kill here, then it's pretty much lights out. They go for the kill, and in comes ETC. They're escorting through those few stacks, and yep, that's the pumpkins. That's a triple shot. That's one point on the core, and we have a triple altar. This is very, very much so lights out. Seven seconds. Dibbles is down for 28. There's three of them on the map right now. You only need to get one. They're already zoning out the bottom. And that's going to be Tracer is going to be trying to move in. But there's already the water elemental. Yeah, trying to slow her down. They get the kill against Tracer. They go for Tacita. And that is the 2-0 lead in the best of five for Granite Gaming as they finish Towers of Doom and take the victory on map number two. Game number three, everybody! Battlefield of Eternity. We have Granite Gaming against Nothing Left. And so far, Granite Gaming has been pretty much killing it. Nothing Left really has to step it up if they want to come back into the series, because it really looks like Granite Gaming has... I mean, I don't know if Lauba has a hot date later on or something. It says, like, boys, let's go. We need to finish that shit. Something's definitely going on there. Because they are rushing through these games like crazy at this point. So I'm actually... Really interested in this. Anna banned. Again, first pick, first ban on the side of nothing left. They lost game two, so they had the choice again, which means Battlefield of Eternity as a map was the choice of Granite Gaming. So, yeah, my F being banned out again. Doesn't shock me at all. We talked about Blake Hitney. He is great on this one. And nothing left. What did they ban out? Again, <sighs> Tracer for both sides is an option. So if, Granite, if nothing left doesn't want to play her, we need to think about maybe banning her out. Hammer, another problem here. Zeratul, another ban. Turanda can be banned out. <laughs> yeah, there's a Turanda ban. All right. There we have that. Um, and with Turanda being banned out, that is pretty much sick. Um, okay, you don't have to go for a Malfurion first pick. That's still Rhaegar that's pretty good on the map. We've seen a few other supports slowly starting to make their way back in. But if they want to have a composition around Malf, then they probably have to pick it early. That's definitely a thing. Yeah, there's... The second support ban offsets a little bit what you usually see on the map. And actually we have Blick Hitney picking Zaratul. Yeah, don't be confused. John Paul Diva is, Bli is uh, DAB. And the Zaratul player at this point is Blick Hitney. They switched accounts. 
Sometimes some of the players don't have the uh, they don't have some heroes on one account and switch to another account to play those heroes um, since HGC times are over where you just own every hero if you are a player on that level. And another aspect of it is also there was actually a couple of problems in the past when lobbies were created that some players couldn't join with a certain account and had to switch accounts again and go in with a different one. Um, so there's a couple of aspects of this, but yeah, they switched the account, so John Paul Diva is still a DAB and Zara Tool is Play Kidney, as we said before. Okay, Malfurion and Jane are getting picked early on. Again, obviously things change slightly when uh, Tirana is banned out, but still the early support pick for Granite. Well, yeah, Li Ming and Mopsio actually on ETC this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's have a quick look at the ban pattern. I mean, at this point, Mopsy on ETC is still on the main tank. They could obviously always switch it over, but what is Polyboss going to play on the offlane with this particular setup here? You kind of want to combo something off Zavitool, and they're actually banning out Deckard Kane. Linked was known for his Deckard Kane plays. Again, this map with Lightning Shield makes Rega very attractive, but if you have Deckard Kane with that setup, that's a lot that you can pull off with that on a combo level. So we are actually seeing, uh, for now, Hanzo banned out. I like the Deckard Kane. Honestly, the more I think about it, the more I like the Deckard Kane ban. That's a great ban on their part. And picks now on the other side. Again, you can go into Garrosh again if you want to. Still a bit wondering if they're gonna pick Ty's Tracer now that they have Malfurion and Jaina's also in the mix. Zeratul on the other side. Could definitely go for a Tracer play if Ty feels like that's the way to go here. Imperius and Diablo! Alright, the CC is there. The CC is definitely there. Uh, let's have a look of what the last two picks here are. It's the offlane that interests me the most. What we're gonna see on the offlane side now. We have seen a fair amount of Rexa here too, I just don't think it's gonna be the thing. Karazim, alright, and Arthas, okay baby. That's a heavy commitment there. <laughs> that makes that Tracer really unattractive all of a sudden. You have an Arthas and a Karazim against you? Uh, probably would think about the Tracer twice. It's not like Ty can't play any other heroes here. He definitely has enough up his sleeve. Or is he actually ballsy enough to just say, you know what, we're still going for it. Uh, they are... Off here! All the stuns. Coffin Girl comes in. Game number three, everybody. It is Battlefield of Eternity. Let's see if nothing left can finally start a bit of a comeback here of Granite Gaming closes out the series with a quick 3-0 as we're heading into the third map. Game number three! And maybe even the last one on the left side. Nothing left. Do they have something left? Yes or no? That's the question. Boss on Arthur's. Mopsy on ETC. We have DAB on Liming, Blick Kidney on Zaratul and Linked on Karazim. On the right side of the map, hanging on with Furion for Granite Gaming, Fury on Imperius, Slam Karata on Jaina, Lauban Diablo, and Ty on Orphea. Time to shine for nothing left. Go hard or go home, your choice, but one of the two is gonna happen right here. Builds pretty much the norm already with the Soul Shield on Diablo on level 1 against potential Wombos, and especially, of course, the Liming damage. Can soak a little bit more of these combos later on when we're having the Immortal on the map. And uh, we're seeing DAB fire. Again, two accounts got switched, the players are still the same. Some of them just don't own all the heroes, or have other reasons to change the accounts. But John Paul Diva is still the AB, and Zeratul is played by Blake Kidney, as we said before, in case there is some confusion about that. So, with this, we're having actually our four man at the bottom of the map, and Arthur's on the off lane, still going off against Imperius. Imperius also, so far, at least with a standard build, going for the burn, the impure on level one, all about the Valorous brand here. So, normally you go trade, trade, and then holy fervor uh, for the AoE damage. Tai comes in. There's a little bit of time for Coffin Girl to get some damage in. Ty is honestly playing a pretty sick off here. I'm a little bit curious to see how much of an impact he can have in this particular match because there's a lot of CC on the side of them. I mean, you have Jaina and off here. He has a lot of burst damage if you get that out properly. And with the additional stuns that we're seeing from Diablo, from Imperius, the roots on Malfurion, and the slows on Jaina, I really think that Ty should be able to do a lot of damage here. 
That's at least what we would expect. Top side is where we're currently having the poke against Fury himself. And this is a four man with a camp. Same at the bottom of the map. Uh, but Ophia is also rotating top. <laughs> yeah, I'm obviously the only one. ETC doesn't really have a lot to stop this. So yeah, this wall is gonna fall. Question is more so what's gonna happen at the top. And as it turns out, the wall is falling a little bit quicker here. So the rotation is in. Swam Karota sitting at the side here. Uh-oh, uh-oh, and that's a kill. Yep, a little bit too greedy here. Trying to move in in a straight line, straight up against Arthas and the Howling Blast. Dumb idea. Didn't quite work out for him, was a little bit too greedy with that. Wasn't going for the safe rotation here, but trying to see if he can maybe take the shortcut. The quick answer on this is, uh, no, you cannot. And yeah, he paid the price. Talking about paying the price, Lauber at the same time he might play the price at the bot lane. Yep, that's the second kill. Looks like nothing left is a little bit mad right now. And going in with a double kill, starting up game number two. Definitely a better start than on game one and two for them. Uh, game number three, that is. All right, so how much can we expect now from Granite Gaming on the objective? They have the setup. It's not that they don't have a lot of synergy on these heroes, but it feels like nothing left is at least meshing a bit better together in this game now. At least the early game looks like that. So with this now, we're having, again, uh, DAB sitting here with his Liming firing and helping out with the Shaman camp that is now going to push the bot lane. Same happens obviously on the other side. Earlier rotation towards the uh, Immortal and starting to go for the push down here on the other hand. Svankorota, Mopsio sees it and yep, still mounted, can easily move away here. ETC obviously a great hero on the map. You can easily slide through someone when those Immortal stuns are on the map or even push them back into one of them. ETC also can provide the protection for the immortal himself with a face melt, so he is a fantastic hero on the map. And with all the lockdown that they have right now, they might be able to make the plays here. Fury is already sitting here at the side. The obvious idea is to always get the lunge connected and open up for the rest of the team. Quick burn and the halftime show already won in favor of Granite Gaming, so they get the slight lead here. They're a bit behind experience. That's not really a big deal just yet. Uh, now the reposition. It's all about the question, can you burn it down? Yes, no. There's already the attempt to flank around. Uh-oh, yeah, that was nearly a kill, but this could be one. Podiboss is low and has to move away. Ty is dancing around, is chomping, and is going for the Shadow Walls. They get the kill against Blake Hitney. Zeratul is down, a nice slide from Opsio as they're trying to at least save the rest of the team. But Granite Gaming is trying to go for the Immortal, and they should be able to win this one now easily. And obviously, there's a rotation towards the left, but they won't be able to take too many of the hit points off. That's going to be a big victory here for Granite Gaming. Great move at this point. Really nicely done. So that is pretty solid. It was a good kill against Zeratul. And I mean, think about it initially. It honestly looked like the setup would be able to collapse onto Malfurion. With ETC moving in from the side, Arthur's coming in, and they just provide enough protection for him to survive through it. So nicely played. Granite Gaming now with an opportunity to take a slight lead here. At the bottom of the map, yeah, double against Orphea actually. But Ty so far staying safe. Oh, Blake Kidney wants the kills. Shadow Walls might come in again, and Ty is murdering that Zeratul. Right now, with only the wormhole, doesn't really seem like Blake Kidney has a chance against Orphea at this point. And the gate, ga the wall is already gone. As expected, we're seeing the Holy Fervor, having the Malevolence taken. Oh, Arthur's actually starting to be a little bit in trouble. And Ty comes in from the side now too, trying to deliver the final blow. Shadow Walls comes in, take him down. And yep, it looks like Zeratul is also going to eat a lot of damage. If the slow comes through, they get the second kill and indeed they are able to pull it off. Two down, they go for ATC and holy shit is Granite Gaming wrecking them today. Nothing left, played some fantastic games lately. We just saw earlier the match against Team Russia, but at this point, Granite Gaming is just unleashed. I'm sticking with my theory, Lauber has a hot date later. It's the only explanation there. Yeah, John Paul gets caught and just stays still. I mean, at this point, he knows he's dead. At that point, he knows already, okay, I'm down, so whatever, yeah. Bit too greedy, bit too far out, and now with the minion wave, they're moving in. Five kills against two. Yeah, they have to dig deep. Nothing left has to dig deep at this point and just say, guys, we can still pull this off. They have to channel their inner team Russia. That's pretty much what I'm trying to say here. If you've watched any of the Russian teams, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that's what they're going to try and do. Now, again, 
The forts are both down, and that's obviously bad news, because with the forts, the fountains have also fallen, so there's no real retreat point anymore. But let's look at the bright side. If you check out the experience for just a moment, there is a lead for Granite Gaming, but it's not really big enough to have this massive snowball effect and create a bit of an avalanche here. Bleak Hitney is nearly taking down the fort. I'm not quite sure if he can... I should actually be able to manage that, honestly. If he sacrifices himself for this, and yes, he does, then they're gonna get it. That's honestly fine. I mean, Zeratul goes down, but that's... I, I mean, I told, call total worth here. Zeratul is gonna be back for the next... Uh, for the next Immortal phase. He gets the fort. That was totally worth it. At that point, you can't do anything anyways. Level 10 for the other team will allow them to take your Shaman camp, no matter if Zeratul is on the board or not. We're having Wrath actually taken from Granite, and ooh, they're not going, they're not going for it. Nope, they don't have everybody around because the rest of the team was taking the Shaman camp on the right side. Yeah, now level 10 is soon going to be ready, and then they can fight for the halftime show. So yeah, Zeratul is starting to all go in again. Okay, there's the stun. Nice! That's exactly why you play ETC in Living here. Fury gets bodied. <laughs> Bro, DAB with the setup and now the Void Prison. And they go for it, taking the life of Jaina and Diablo. <laughs> Nothing left. They are fully behind and then they are just absolutely dumpstering on Granite Gaming. Taking three down within seconds and it all started with them. Pretty much stun locking Imperius into the Immortal stun and taking him out there. Now Jaina is about to be back. The top lane, that's still a problem. That's not only a Shaman camp, but that's obviously also a Catapult that is chipping in too. And now the attempt at a quick race, but the rest of the team is already moving in. They're trying to burn the down as quickly as they can. Rest of the team is there. They're trying to go for the kill against Arthur. So far, not successful. Arthur doesn't have the army anymore. Here comes the players. Oh my god, the wall stun against Karazim. Get wrecked. Karazim is down, and they get the kill too against Zaratul. And that immortal is still alive. Unbelievable. Now, a little bit of poke is all they need, but they are already sharking around. The wall stun! Oh, ETC! Oh, <laughs> Mopsio! And he survives on 200 HP. The Immortal is still being fought over by the two DPS, and it looks like they might be able to get it. Even if they don't, it's so low on HP that the shield won't be too much of an obstacle. Uh, DAB is trying to get an angle at the Immortal. It's finally getting close, but they actually take it. Granite Gaming takes Immortal number two. The fight is still there. Here's the Globes that come out. Uh, can they save Fury? Oh, the ult! from Ty off here with the jaws and the death of Arthas. And in comes the second kill. ETC falls victim to the apocalypse. Svamkrota on the run and he dies but so does Zeratul. They're going for the kill against Karazim and the only survivor in this case is Li Ming and they're even letting him go. They don't care. And he's sacrificing himself as well. What the hell? Someone's tilted. I mean, at this point, it really seems that nothing left is just in free fall and full on tilt mode. And I can't even blame them. I mean, this is number one against the number two team. And it's an absolute unmitigated disaster with an 0 and 2, and they're losing that again. That is definitely an indication of a couple of problems here on their side at this point. Keep is going to fall now, too. And yep, that's. I mean, it is looking bad. 13 kills against six. One and a half level lead, and from a structural point of view, it's a problem, and a big one at that. Right now, they're just moving away from this. Obviously, Granite Gaming is eager to end this here as soon as they can. They're looking for level 16. They have the advantage and talents at this point, too. But yeah, down here, Fury just is sitting, Mopsio sitting at the front. Let's take a quick look at the damage output before you have the 13s coming in. 23,000 damage, top damage in the game from Li Ming still. Ah, but Ty is sitting at 20,000 and they're actually looking to see... They're going for... Yep, they're gonna get killed. <laughs> their quick kill! And now Zeratul also with the sacrifice here. I mean, at this point he knows that he's pretty much down there too. But yeah, they are on tilt right now. Either they are on tilt or they're just resigned to the fact that they are not gonna be able to come back into this game. It's one or the other. But this series is definitely not going the way that nothing left expected it to. They had some great performances over the last few days and weeks, but at this point, Granite Gaming is just showing them who's boss in this particular match. 15 kills against 6 right now. The insta-kill against Liming, pretty much shutting down all the hopes of winning that fight. And this is starting to become an issue. I mean, 
especially since 16 is so close. That's the biggest problem. Once that the Immortal is on the map, I do not think there's a chance for nothing left to get the talent for themselves. Now camps are being taken. That obviously exacerbates the problem even more. 30 seconds, that's not enough time to soak one and a half levels. And yeah, with that, we're going to see the 16 coming in from uh, Granite. And obviously, they're in a position where this is pretty much... This is their match to lose. Let's put it like this. It's not over just yet for nothing left. If they get another good fight, you got a quick triple kill earlier. They can definitely still turn this around. And you can see them going full aggression right now. They know that they're trying to force the fight before 16. But there's the talent. And Fury is already going in. Trying to go for the ult. Doesn't connect. Uses the cooldown. Well down here. Swam Grotta is in trouble. Mosh pit. Can they get the kill? Jaina is low. And wow. Survives for a bit longer than expected. But dies eventually. ETC has also fallen. So does Zeratul. They're going for Porti Boss. The army is on the ground. But he won't be able to run away from this one. No escape. Ty dancing around. Getting the kill. That's three kills already. As Lauba is looking for another one. Trying to go for Li Ming on Karazim here. Yeah. They're jumping in again. And they get the kill. They get the kill again. Mouth, but the double kill as the entire team gets wiped. A five man team wipe as they're taking them down, and now the top lane is the target with a double catapult and double camp. They're easily taking down the keep here. An absolute easy killer with 20 kills against two. They can then decide if they even want to go for core. Immortal is a little bit more likely, to be honest with you. If they wanted to go core, they would have done that immediately by moving down to the bottom of the map. So now. We're having actually Jaina moving back in. They're already retreating here. Three levels ahead. Stats advantage alone is crazy. And they can now go for the Immortal itself. But with three catapults down, there's obviously now also lane pressure against the core of nothing left that eventually will force them to retreat here. With this, we're now also having the yeah, 30 versus 30,000, the damage output here. Only hero that hasn't died is uh, off here. Ty hasn't fallen yet. Half time show has already won. There's the Void Prison against two. Void Prison is in. Wrath is being used. And the double kill against Malfurion and Jaina. Both of them die immediately. Is that honestly the setup? They're getting a kill again against Diablo. He's losing the souls now. They're still on the defensive. Catapults are already pushing in against the quad. This is a triple catapult setup. We're only 13 minutes in. 13, 14 minutes. But someone has to deal with that crap. Yeah, that's four catapults. All right, it's going to be Arthur's that deals with it. Again, these catapults don't hurt too much yet because we're only 14 minutes in. But you got to be careful with this. Already the attack attempt here to defend this a little bit more. But it looks like this is going to be the first immortal in the favor of the blue team. Apocalypse without the setup. Ty moving in, moving out. Big advantage still here. Core hasn't lost any hit points yet. Ty is in trouble. Good connect that we're seeing from Imperius as Fury is trying to prevent the worst. But the Immortal is taken. Immortal is taken. Ty gets attacked. Zeratul comes in and wants the kill and he gets the kill. Takes him down. 12 kills against 20. And this is the first Immortal for them. 50%. That's what we're seeing here. And nothing left seems to be a little bit angry right now. The full on aggression and honestly some great kills that we've seen so far. So trying to fight behind all of this. The defense is still there at the back. They were also probably a little bit concerned about a potential backdoor. Triple catapult top lane. Definitely need your attention. Ooh, Arthur's down. They got the kill here. Jumping into the fight. Top lane got deep push in the meantime. Then obviously the Immortal cannot be defended against. 33 kills in this. 33 kills in the game here. And we're having now the Immortal moving straight towards the fort itself. But it's actually unlikely that they're even going to get the kill against this one. Nope, only a little bit of hit point damage and that's it. Well, so once again, we're having uh, 20 talents on the board next. One and a half levels away. But again, as the game continues with both keeps down, I, I just don't think you can come back into this. Pretty much what nothing left has to do is win a big ass immortal now on the next phase and get it through a, pretty much a team wipe. And then they have a chance, but it's just those continuous catapults that we're now going to see at the bot lane. 14 minutes in, those bad boys are not really a, being a problem. But 16, 17, the more we're nearing 20, all of a sudden you're going to start and struggle against this. And bot lane is going to be the biggest problem. Because on the bot lane, there is still a fort, which means that there's not even a catapult on every third wave for nothing left to at least balance it out a little bit. So, yeah, it's going to be rough going. And obviously level 20, Storm Talents, this is, <laughs> this is the biggest problem. This is honestly the biggest issue that they have to deal with in uh, this particular setup. Camp taken on both sides now. Uh, Mopsy obviously still dancing around at the bottom. They would love to force a fight now. If they can force the fight right now, that would be the dream. Lauba is just sitting at the side. Keep in mind, he lost his souls. 
He's currently sitting only at 17. That's not really a whole lot. I need to be a bit careful with that. And there's the Immortal coming in. They don't have 20 yet, so this is going to be a fort for nothing left. Granite is not going to fight over this. <laughs> they play so passive right now. They know exactly that 20 is just a huge advantage for them. That it would be insane for them to take a fight before 20 if they don't have to. And they would rather sacrifice the fort and then fight for it. Already Zeratul has to move back because of this. Someone needs to deal with this here. And that's going to be the 20 now. They're going to take the Shaman down. They're going to take the wave. And that's going to be the Storm Talons. It allows at least uh, the uh, halftime show for nothing left. You can go for the Immortal. Burn that down quickly. But there's the Storm Talons now. And with the Storm Talons, there's the attack. Once again, the Valorous Pursuit already taken here. Uh, okay. Starting to slowly claim the position. Also at the same time, we're seeing the Engulfing Oblivion taken. All about the armor reduction a lot of the heroes right now. But, yep, time works in favor of Granite Gaming. One catapult is starting to slowly home in on the core from the top lane. The second one is pushing in. As long as they can prolong that, it's fine. But ideally, of course, they would try and get the kills here. Mobs here is looking for the mosh pit. That's the halftime show. First catapult is in. Second one is coming. One is offsetting it slightly. But, yep, everybody is still looking for the kill opportunity. And obviously, Granite Gaming wants to try and get that fight before the opponent hits level 20. That's another one. And with Zeratul moving in, that's usually when you see that move. And the move goes for... Yeah, the move goes here to the bottom. There's the first stun. And there's the kill. The insta-kill against Slimming. The main damage gone. And that is going to be a problem. Already the quick move in with the ice block on the side of Slum Grotta. Double connect with the stuns here from Furious. They are moving in again and they want to go for the core. They don't even want to go for the objective at this point. They're looking for an opportunity to end the game. Kana pulls at the top lane uh, against the massing, but it doesn't really matter any more longer. At this point, it's just all about the attempt to go for the game itself. And they're starting to move in with this. They want another kill before Li Ming comes back. Without the reset potential, they have a much better chance to go for the core right now. Second setup fails, but go for Karazim, Karazim, there's a silence, there's the kill, and there is the APOC, but the four-man void prison, ooh, that's gonna be a mosh pit, and it's only hitting one hero, and ETC falls, the core is already suffering damage, and that is going to be game, ladies and gentlemen, Granite Gaming destroys nothing left with a 3-0 in the best of five, and they claim the pole position in the standings again, GG, and well played by Granite Gaming.